What I would like to do in the next few minutes is to give you a different way of understanding how the body works. And there's one thing for me to stand up here and talk about it, but it's a whole other thing for me to show you. So I'm wondering if anyone is here in the audience that has any pain that you'd like to get rid of. Anybody have pain? No, here's somebody with some pain. Would you like me to help you with it? If you'll come up and go through that uh, curtain and you can come around this way. There you go. Go right through where he is. And one more, please. And I'd suggest those of you who are in the back, if you'd like to see better what we're doing, if you want to come up closer, it's a lot easier to see what's happening up here if you're closer to us. So, what is your name? Carrie. Okay, this is Carrie. Have we ever met? No. Nope, so we don't know each other. I don't have any idea who she is or what's wrong with her, but let's see if we can help her. So, Carrie, tell us what's going on. Uh, I've got some pain in my arm and some weakness when I try to pick up things. Um, a tender spot here on my elbow, and I think I may have hit it rather hard three or four weeks ago. I'm not sure. I've tapped it a few times since then, and it hurts when I, you know, if I hit it on the kitchen counter or something like that. All right. So I don't know if you heard what she said. She has pain in this elbow. She's not sure if she hit it or not, but it's been bugging her for three weeks or so? Yeah, yeah three or yeah. four weeks. So <clears throat> one of the things we'd want to know is how bad is this pain? So if one is I can barely feel it, and ten is I want to shoot myself, how much pain do you have in your elbow? Uh, Like right now, I have no pain. Um, I, have t I have some tenderness when I try to move my arm, and if I hit it, I would say it's about a four. Okay, so she's not in, in excruciating pain or really much pain at the moment, but if she tries to move it around, or certainly if she hits it, it, it uh, bothers her. So will you be able to tell if I change it? Yes. She, so she can tell if we change it. So I'm gonna, tell me your name again. Carrie. Carrie, Carrie, I'm gonna have you stand closer down here. Now one of the things I'd like for us to do, first of all, is to look and see if uh, her ears are on crooked. Because people who have pain usually have their ears are on crooked and uh, fixing that is the first thing you always want to do. So one of the things we're going to do is just look at her, which you can see her from the front more easily than I, and look and see if you think her ears are crooked. And then secondly, I want you to look and see if her shoulders are level. And if you think she has one shoulder higher than the other, and then finally, look and see if you can see if her pelvis is rotated. Now, Carrie, I'm going to touch your ears here, if I may. And what you're going to see is that her right ear is uh, maybe an inch lower than her left one. Let me turn you a little bit this way so these folks can see you. All right, and back over here. Can you see from that distance that she's got one ear higher than the other, that this one's significantly higher? Did you all see that? Now the other thing I want you to notice is that this shoulder's a lot higher. You see that? So let's turn you to each portion of the crowd here so they can see. <coughs> see that? Now if I put my hands right on top of her hips like this, what you're going to see is that I have one hand higher than the other because her pelvis is rotated. Can you see that from out there? I can't see from back here but I know whenever the ears are on crooked, the pelvis is rotated 100% of the time. Now the other thing we'll look and see is if she can turn her head to the right and left and how far. Now turn it the other way. So she, her head moves pretty well. Uh, just a few minutes ago, I had a fellow who had a car wreck who could, couldn't move his head very well, and of course we fixed that. The other thing I'm going to show you is if she faces the, over that green curtain over there and just stands here with her eyes closed, she'll going to notice she stands pretty still. <coughs> Excuse me. Notice that she's not moving very much. That means her cranial sacral pump is turned off. There's a pump inside the brain and the spinal cord that normally pumps and uh, puts uh, fresh fluid into the nervous system, and hers isn't working. So that's another problem that she has. So what we're going to do is fix that for her. And we're going to do it with what's called a biomodulator. It's this little gadget that has an electrode on one side and the controls on the other. So Gary, if you'll just stand back over here like this for me so I can get beside you. I'm going to just put this down in what's called automatic mode and just look straight ahead for me. And we're going to just press here. Tell me when you feel a little tingle. Okay. I'm going to turn it back down. 
Now I'm going to hold this here for one minute. Every once in a while you'll feel a little prickle on the side of your neck, but it shouldn't be unpleasant. If it is, tell me so I can turn it down, okay? okay. So this part is kind of like watching the grass grow. You just have to sit here for a minute. But what's happening behind the scenes is that we're putting certain frequencies into this. Uh, and the, the, this is pulsing up and down. Uh, and the frequencies that we're putting in are designed to resonate with the body and it's going to recenter this bone here in her skull called the sphenoid bone. And when it recenters that, the brain is going to tell all of the rest of her anatomy to get back in alignment where it belongs. Because it's the position of this bone and the center of gravity of the skull that controls everything about how you stand and, uh, and about whether or not that pump works. Okay, there's the minute that's gone by, so now we're going to go to the other side. And we're going to do exactly the same thing. Tell me when you can feel a little tingle. Okay. I'm going to turn it back down. And now, again, we just stand here for another minute. And then we're going to see if we've helped her get this fixed, because a lot of times, uh, painful sensations in the arms actually are coming from the neck. So you have to get this fixed first. Plus, no matter what you do for someone, you need to always fix this and turn this pump on because when this pump is shut off, you're stuck in what's called sympathetic on mode, which means you have trouble uh, digesting, sleeping, and healing. And so fixing this is a quick and easy way to balance out the sympathetic parasympathetic nervous systems. So we're almost done with this. That should be good. Now I'm going to ask you, Carrie, to turn your head right and left as far as it'll go. That's better than it was a while ago. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Now move your shoulders around and then rotate your back. And then watch the chair there. Just walk a little bit and come back to me. And let's see if we've made anything different for you. <coughs> Perfect. Perfect. So now, if you look at this group over here again, I'm going to touch your ears once more. Put my fingers in as far as they'll go, and you see what? See how they're straight? Okay, let's show these people over here that your ears are not on crooked anymore. See that? Now you get the correction about 80% of the shoulders immediately. The other 20%, this shoulder will come on up tomorrow and be normal, but already her pelvis is straight. You see that? Now, if she closes her eyes, go ahead and face over there, Carrie. Close your eyes and just stand there. And what you're going to see is that she begins to sway, but it's, at this point, it's going to be a sputter. So you'll see her sputtering just a little bit. There she goes, because we're just turning her pump back on, and it's been off for a while, so it sputters. If you look at her 30 minutes from now, it'll be a nice, smooth 10 times a minute, just like it should be. See her beginning to sway? That's her pump turning back on. So now then we've got that fixed and now it's just a matter of talking about this elbow. Can you pull this sleeve up or I need, just need to get to that elbow or take your sweater off, whichever is easier. Now one of the interesting things about pain is that chronic pain is always defined by low voltage. And we'll be talking more about that in a minute when we get into the lecture part. But whenever the body has low voltage, it always creates a magnetic field. And wherever it's a magnetic field, it'll be sticky. So I'm just going to turn this device on Bring it up to where she can feel it. Tell me when you feel a tingle. Feel anything? Mm -hmm. Okay, now I do. Okay, so now she felt it. We'll turn it down just a little bit to be sure it doesn't get too hot for her. Don't want to aggravate her in any way. And then we'll just move this elbow until we find out where it's sticky. And there it is right there. So she's got some low voltage right in this spot because it sticks to her. Can't, I don't know if you can see as I go past her, it's slick and then just hangs up. Can you perceive that from the audience? So I know where she is either having pain or susceptible to pain because the, she has a magnetic field there. The voltage is low, so I am simply putting electrons in. And as soon as I get the, the voltage back up to 50 millivolts, she'll heal this and then she won't have trouble with it anymore. So it's pretty quick and easy to fix these things and to find out where the problem is. So you can see I can find it and there probably, yeah, there's another one right there. So what I'm going to suggest we do, since I have only a few minutes of time to lecture to you about what I'm doing, I'm going to suggest that maybe 
Uh, she, you see the, the fellow in the middle back there, Charles? Charles, would you hold up your hand? If you'll go back there, either now or later, Charles will put a little bit of voltage in there and that will allow that to heal for you and you'll be fine. Okay. So um, can you s tell any difference at all in either the elbow or in how you feel in general than you did 15 minutes ago? Um, I feel better in my neck. I had some stiffness in my neck as well and so that does feel better. As far as my elbow, I can't tell yet. Okay. So we've uh, made her neck better, and as soon as Charles has a few minutes to treat the elbow, it will, we'll check back in with you. Already pressing on this bone, it's not tender like it was. All right, she said pressing on the bone, it's not tender like it was. So what, I, I worked on it, what, two minutes? So normally I would work on it longer, but because my time with you is short and I want to try to explain some of these things that will be helpful to you, I'm going to let Charles work on you and then we'll talk to you again. Thanks okay. for coming up. Thank you. I've shown you what I'm going to be talking to you about so that you'll have some idea that this is not just uh, somebody's idea, but it's something that actually works. So let's get started here. By the way, I, wanted, I need to tell you this. I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, Professor Andrew Weil is a famous medical doctor out in Arizona at the medical school. Uh, most of you know uh, Andy Weil. Well, the FDA and the FTC sent him a letter saying he must stop telling people that taking herbs to improve their immune system will help keep them from getting the flu or they put him in jail. And so then there was a professor last year who, uh, at Boston University, a dermatologist, a famous one, who said it's good for you to go out in the sun and get vitamin D, and so they fired him. And so now there are laws that are passed that are going to keep people like uh, Sally Fallon from telling her story about food and nutrition. So uh, the only way, and in Texas it's very difficult for MDs to talk about nutrition without losing their license. So I'm not talking to you today using my MD license. I'm talking to you today using my naturopathic license and in my role as a, an ecclesiastical counselor. So just for the record, uh, I'm not talking to you as an MD today. I've done a variety of things uh, in my life, but I'm basically trained as an ophthalmologist and practice ophthalmology for 30 years. And I did the majority of research for the laser that's used in LASIK surgery. So I had a lot of fun doing that research, but unfortunately we didn't know at the time that uh, the laser wouldn't kill viruses. And so uh, when I treated some people that had viruses in their corneas, the viruses came up, went through my mask, into my nose and into my brain, and I got encephalitis. So here's how I got the encephalitis from the laser. Here's how I spent most of the next seven years or so. I slept about 16 hours a day. I would have uh, about three or four hours a day in which I could think clearly enough to understand a newspaper and then like a light switch it would go off and I couldn't understand it anymore. And so during those two or three hours a day that I could think, I had to try to figure out how to get myself well. So my journey began when I got these pictures from my friend Janet who had this lymphoma around her neck and was told by MD Anderson that nothing could be done and just to go home and die. And so instead she went to Mexico and began to get some treatment. And as you can see, three weeks after she began the treatments, her tumors were gone. And so when she sent me these photographs, I uh, went down to see how they did that. And that started my journey on into integrative and natural medicine. So here's the thing. As I was sitting sick trying to figure out how to get well, I had the idea that if I could figure out how to make one cell work, I could make them all work. Because even though a brain cell and a liver cell look different, they really have the same hardware, don't they? Just like a computer, a laptop looks different than a desktop, but they're still the same hardware. It's just a matter of, of different software. And so I thought if I could figure out how to make one cell work, I could make them all work. And so I began to read cellular biology books, and what I discovered was that most of all of the books said cells have to run in very narrow ranges of things and particularly something that caught my attention was a narrow range of pH. Well you can see that cells have to have a narrow range of glucose and if, they're, if that's too high we call it diabetes and if it's too low we call it hypoglycemia. Cells have to run in a very narrow range of temperature and if it's too high we call it a fever and if it's too low it shows that you have hypothyroidism you have to have a very narrow range of blood pressure and if it's too high we call that hypertension and too low hypotension. 
But pH and oxygen is something the doctors rarely look at unless you're in ICU. But I was particularly fascinated about the subject of pH. So let's take a look at some electronic terms. Here's the thing. pH stands for potential hydrogen, but is really, although it's about acid-base balance, it's really about voltage. The way you measure pH is you take a sophisticated voltmeter and you measure the voltage of a solution. Now there's something different about a solution than a copper wire. The copper wires that are bringing voltage into the building here are either turned on or off. So there are either electrons in those wires or not, correct? You turn the switch on, the electrons are there. You turn the switch off, they go away. But in a solution, like a glass of water, you have an option. That water can either be an electron donor or it can be an electron stealer. And so that's what's different about measuring voltage in a solution is that it has the option of being one or the other. Well, by convention, if the, if the solution happens to be an electron donor, we put a minus sign in front of the voltage. If it happens to be an electron stealer, we put a plus sign in front of the voltage. So when you measure the voltage of a solution, if it measures plus 400 millivolts, we convert that to a logarithmic scale from 0 to 14 and call plus, 100, uh, plus 400 millivolts a pH of 0. And a minus 400 millivolts with minus meaning electron donor is the same thing as a pH of 14. So I found it's much easier to think about what's going on by thinking in terms of voltage rather than thinking in terms of pH, right? Well, what this tells us is this. Every cellular biology book will tell you that cells are designed to run at a pH of between 7.35 and 7.45. Well, what that means is that a pH of 7.35 is the same thing as minus 20 millivolts. And what does minus mean? Electron donor, right? Minus is electron donor, right? So cells are designed to be run between minus 20 millivolts and 7.45 is minus 25 millivolts. Okay, so now we got something really important, don't we? And this is one of the things I want you to take away from this meeting. Every cell in your body is designed to be run between minus 20 and minus 25 millivolts. Just like your refrigerator is designed to run at 110 volts, your car is designed to run at 12 volts, your cells are designed to run at between minus 20 and minus 25 millivolts. Got it? Okay, now we're cooking. Now, let's take a look at the difference between electron stealers and electron donors. Electron stealer causes damage. It's a pH between zero and 6.9, and we call it acidic. So you read, when you read books that say, disease, uh, disease is always caused by the body being acidic, it's the same thing as saying the disease is caused when the body loses its voltage. You see that? Because the word acidic is the same thing as being over in the electron stealer category. A free radical, we taught, read about illnesses caused by free radicals. Well, free radical is simply an electron that's a mugger. It's a, a molecule that's a mugger. He's out looking for somebody's purse to steal, right? He's out looking for somebody's electrons to steal. So a free radical goes around stealing electrons from cell membranes and damaging them in the process. Now, for, uh, electron stealers are the positive pole. They're destructive, and at the atomic level, they spin left. Now, electron donors, on the other hand, can do work. It's a pH of 7, 1 to 14, and it's, we call that alkaline. So when you read books like Alkalize or Die, we're saying, if you don't have voltage, you're going to die. You see that? It's the same thing. It's a synonym. So acidic means that you're in electron stealer status. Alkaline means you're in electron donor status. And that's the important thing. Antioxidants. Antioxidants are molecules that are very charitable. They're looking for somebody to give their money away to, namely their electrons. So when your mother says to you, eat your vegetables, they're good for you, she's saying, eat your vegetables, they have, they have voltage in them and you need that. You see that? They're the negative pole, they're constructive and they spin right. When you see this slide, you might ask the question, didn't anybody ever teach you not to put so many numbers on one slide? Well, I did it on purpose because I wanted to see you to have the ability to see the conversion of one number to another. But basically what I want you to get off this slide is this. Here's a minus 20 millivolts, which is the same thing as a pH, cell pH of 7.35. Here's a minus 25, which is 7.44. Now the colors that are on this chart are the same as pH strips. So if you go down to the health food store or to the pool supply and get a pH strip, 
and measures your saliva, these colors correspond to that. So you can see there's quite a bit of change in voltage with just one change in the color on your strip, isn't there? Now here's the second part of the thing I want you to know. We he heal primarily by making new cells. You make new cells very rapidly. The rods and cones in your uh, eye right now are only 48 hours old. The skin you're sitting in is just six weeks old. Your liver is eight weeks old. Your nervous system is eight months old and your bones are a year old. So every year we completely change ourselves. And so we're rapidly making new cells to completely replace ourselves. But here's the thing. To make a new cell requires minus 50 millivolts. So which has more electrons, minus 25 or minus 50? Minus 50 does. Even though it's numerically a smaller number, it still has more horsepower, more electrons than minus 20. So healing requires minus 50. Now here's the problem. When your voltage begins to drop below operating voltage, at a minus 15 millivolts you're tired, at a minus 10 millivolts you get sick, at a minus 5 millivolts things quit working, and as voltage continues to go past zero, where we change polarity, now we're in cancer territory. All cancer occurs at plus 30 millivolts. And plus is what? Electron stealer, right? So there's everything from tired to cancer, and it's all about the voltage, you see? So obviously, no matter what's wrong with you, we need to put enough electrons in to push the voltage back up, not just operating voltage, but to have enough voltage to make a new cell if you're going to heal. Because anytime you're down here and you don't put electrons in, you can't make new cells. If you can't make new cells, you can't get well. You see that? Now, there are several bad things that happen when voltage changes. When you're down here and voltage begins to drop, the first thing that happens is chronic pain. So chronic pain is simply a symptom of low voltage. Chronic pain is simply a symptom of low voltage. So if you have pain, how are you going to fix it? It's easy, put in electrons and get it back up to healing voltage and it gets well. So another bad thing that happens is that as voltage drops, oxygen levels drop. So if I took a glass of water and set it here and I put a tube in it and I began to bubble oxygen into that water, then the amount of oxygen that will dissolve in that water is dictated by the voltage of the water. So if I raise the voltage of the water, more oxygen will dissolve. However, if I lower the voltage of the water, oxygen actually comes out of solution and disappears. Well, our cells are 70% oxygen. What that means then, is that as voltage in a cell begins to drop, oxygen comes out of the cell and you end up with a cell that has inadequate amounts of oxygen. Now, one of the problems with having inadequate amounts of oxygen has to do with our metabolism. For every unit of fat that you put into what's called the Krebs cycle, out the other end, you get 38 molecules of what's called ATP, which is a rechargeable battery that's used in, in enzymatic functions. So 1 to 38 if oxygen is available. However, if oxygen is not available, for every unit of fat you put into the Krebs cycle, you only get two molecules of ATP out. So that's like having a car that goes from 38 miles to the gallon to two miles to the gallon. You see the problem? If your cells are running at two miles to the gallon, how in the world are they going to get enough energy to do their job? They aren't, and therefore you get sick. Now, there's another problem that happens, and that is that each of us contain perhaps a trillion bugs. Now, these bugs are, all, are asleep as long as oxygen is around because they can't function if oxygen is available. However, as soon as our oxygen levels drop, the bugs wake up. And guess what the first thing they want to do is? They want to have lunch, and they want to have you for lunch. So. When these bugs wake up and want to have lunch, they don't have teeth, do they, to take a bite out of your cell. So they put out digestive enzymes to dissolve the cell so they can get the nutrients out of it. Now, when they're putting those uh, digestive enzymes out, they don't just stay locally. They get in your bloodstream and go other places. So for example, let's say I have strep throat. So I've got a strep bacteria up here having lunch on my tonsil. I'm not too happy about it because his having lunch on my tonsil means my throat hurts like the devil, doesn't it? 
But we all know that if you have strep having lunch on your tonsil, that those digestive enzymes can get into the bloodstream and go down and scar your heart valves, right? They can also go down and scar your joints, right? Well, that same process is happening throughout the body. So wherever you have low voltage, the bugs that are there having lunch are putting out toxins that are harming you in other parts of your body. So for example, if I have low voltage in my gallbladder, then the, the toxins that, from the bugs that are having lunch on my gallbladder are damaging my brain. If I have bugs in my sinus, they may be damaging my, uh, my intestine. If I have bugs in my intestine, they may be damaging something else, you see? So no matter what's going on, wherever you have bugs happening, it affects you throughout your whole body. So the point I'm trying to make is that every time voltage drops, you get chronic pain, you get a lack of oxygen, you get inefficient metabolism, and you have bugs having lunch. When you understand what I just told you, you understand essentially all of chronic disease, and you understand why it's not a good idea to go and treat just one thing. For example, if you take antibiotics to get rid of those bugs, well, you may suppress them shortly, but what's going to happen as soon as you get off the antibiotics, if the voltages and the oxygen are still low, they're gonna come right back, aren't they? And so you, you have to deal with what caused it in the first place, and what caused it in the first place was low voltage. You see that? Next slide, please. Oh, let me go back to that slide. There's one thing I want to say because it fits in with some of the conversations that you've heard this weekend. As voltage drops, the different kinds of bugs change from one kind to another. So we start off with viruses, and then we get round bacteria, and then we get oval bacteria, and then we get uh, rod-shaped bacteria, and then we get yeast, and finally we get a fungus that has the little hyphae. Now, I know that uh, Dr. Kaufman's been talking to you about the role of fungus in cancer, right? Guess what allows the fungus to grow? Lack of voltage, lack of oxygen. So we cannot have fungal infections. For example, you cannot have candida if your voltage is normal. Can't happen. So if you have candida and you want to get rid of it, what do you do? Fix the voltage. You see that? So this whole business about our sliding downhill into cancer and that cancer is a fungus, I agree with all of that about cancer being caused by a fungus. But the only thing that allowed the cancer, the fungus to cause your cancer was what? lack of voltage. You see that? So you don't have to worry about uh, all the fungus in the world as long as your voltage is normal. Okay, next slide. So here's the thing. What's the voltage in my thumb here? Minus 20 millivolts, right? Now I hit it with a hammer. Ah! Now the voltage in my thumb immediately goes to what? Minus 50. And it goes to minus 50 because it has to make new cells to replace those that I just smashed with a hammer. So at minus 50 millivolts, one of the things that automatically happens is that the blood vessels dilate. And the reason they dilate is that you need new raw materials to make new cells. And so those vessels have to dilate so they can dump proteins and carbohydrates and fats and vitamins and all that stuff into the neighborhood so you can start making new cells. You see that? So at minus 50 millivolts, when healing is going on, you always have a throbbing pain, it's swollen, it's warm, it's red, and it doesn't work very well. But that's the price you pay because you have to get all the raw materials there. Now, as soon as I finish making new cells and replace all of those I smashed with a hammer, my thumb's going to go back to minus 25 millivolts. It's going to be pink, it, does, it feels fine, works fine, and I'm a happy camper, you see that? Now, here's another scenario. I'm up here at minus 50 millivolts, happily making new cells, and then I run out of voltage. All of a sudden, my voltage drops down to, say, minus 10. Now I've got a big problem, don't I? Because in order to get my thumb well, I have to make new cells to replace those I smashed with a hammer. But I can't make new cells unless I have what? Minus 50 millivolts and the raw materials necessary to make a new cell. Well, I'm down at minus 10. I ran out of juice. So I'm stuck in chronic disease. So at minus 10 in my thumb, you can do all the surgery you want on it. You can give me all the pills you want. But until I can put in enough electrons to get me back to minus 50, I'm stuck in chronic disease. You see that? So that's the magic thing that I want you to take away from today, 
is this. Chronic disease is always defined as low vo by having low voltage. Getting well always happens when you figure out a way to put in electrons. So everything that works, whether you're talking about my biomodulator, whether you're talking about homeopathic remedies, essential oils, uh, anything, swimming with the dolph dolphins, you know, hugging dogs, all those things that help you get well do so by providing electrons because if you don't get electrons, they don't work. Now you have a way to go around the booth and understand what everybody's telling you out there about why you should take their stuff. All you need to know is how many electrons are in that. Then you know how good it is. In fact, you can take a voltmeter that you buy at Radio Shack and go down to the grocery store, measure the voltage in this green bean and in this batch of green beans and know which one's the best because of which one has the most voltage in it. You see that? Okay. So what you see then, if you understand what I just told you about my thumb, you understand why you're sick if you are and you understand how to get well. So we can measure your voltage, which is the beauty of all of this. And we can do this with a biomodulator as uh, you can put it into voltmeter mode and simply go measure uh, and read what the voltage is and then you know what you're dealing with. And then you switch it into treatment mode and it puts electrons back in and that's how you get well. So chronic disease is always low voltage with pain and cells that don't have enough voltage to do the job. Cells can't get rid of waste products and become toxic. Microorganisms grow and release toxins and that when you finally get down to plus 30, fungus takes over your cell and you have cancer. Now, whenever you have chronic disease, one of the questions you need to ask is, why did my voltage drop enough to allow me to get sick, right? Because if I take and just put voltage in and get that part to heal, if you don't figure out what caused it to drop in the first place, it may very well drop again, you see that? Well, first of all, as far as measuring is concerned, this is Dr. Langevin, who's at the medical school up in, um, in Vermont. And what she and her group showed us is that the acupuncture meridians are simply the fascial planes in the body. And let me explain that a little better. The, the tissue in the body that has the least resistance to the flow of electrons is fibrous tissue. So wherever you have fibrous tissue in your body, it's doing two things. One is it's structural, and second is it's moving electrons around. So the fascia are simply the fibrous uh, sheaths around all of our muscles and around all of our organs. And those fibrous sheaths are the acupuncture system and we can tap into those and treat them as a fibrous wire. So I can, for example, if I want to know what the voltage is in my brain, I can just go right here to this acupuncture point and measure it. Neat, huh? So if you'll just go through this series of slides for us, you'll see what you're going to see is that here are all the acupuncture meridians and these are the actual wires from anatomical dissections. One of the things that you need to realize is that our muscles are both electron generators and, the, and our rechargeable batteries. Now a thing called a piezoelectric crystal is simply, for example, if you take a piece of quartz crystal and you squeeze it with a pair of pliers, it emits electrons. That's called the piezoelectric effect. Well, your muscles are piezoelectric, so I'm just sitting here generating electrons by simply moving my muscle, all right? So muscles are electron generators. The other interesting thing about muscles is they're also rechargeable batteries. So one of the reasons that exercise is so important is that it not only generates, but stores voltage for your body to work. So one of the ways you treat yourself is to exercise, and you all know that, right? You just didn't know how it was working, now you do. Next slide. Now, we're wired up in a way that we have a main cable going up our back and another main cable going down the front. You see that? That cable is like the wire that comes from the telephone pole to your garage at your home. All right, next slide. And then we have power terminals on that main cable to supply the voltage to all the organs in that region, just like uh, you have a different power station in Tyler and a different one in Terrell and a different one in every city around here. So it is with your body. So you have a different power terminal for every region of your body. Next slide. So here you see the power uh, terminals. The, there's a terminal for our skull, one in front and one in back. There's a terminal for our neck and upper chest, here and here. There's a terminal for our chest, here and here. There's a terminal for our belly. And there's a terminal for our pelvis. Let's say that you have 
trouble with your heart. What you automatically know is that the voltage in your heart is low, and if it's low, that this terminal right here is going to be low voltage. So if you want to make your heart work better, where do you think a good place to insert some electrons might be? Right there, right? Let's say you have trouble thinking, or you had a, uh, an accident and you drowned, or you had a traumatic head injury and a car wreck, and your brain's not working the way it should be. Where do you think you're going to have low voltage? Here and here. And what might you do to make that better? You put voltage in there. And how do I know that works? Well, I've happened to be fortunate enough to wake several people up out of comas. For example, <clears throat> um, I was uh, driving down to Austin to give a lecture similar to this, and I got a call that there's a little girl in San Antonio, a five-year-old who had drowned, or was near drowning and was in ICU, would I come see her? So I went down to see her, and the, the pediatrician at the ICU was trying to get them to pull the plug. And I said, well, let's go see what's going on. Well, there are three wires, three acupuncture meridians, all coming into that terminal that uh, bring voltage to the brain. So I went in and measured these places, and um, well, only one of the three wires had low voltage. So I simply left my biomodulator there. We put a patch on each side, turned the device on, and let it run. And in about three days, she woke up. How did I know she'd wake up? It's all about the voltage. You see that? It's so easy to see what to do once you understand how the body works. So whatever's wrong with you, you can look at this chart and know which one of these terminals to go look at and then to treat. And then there are lateral terminals over from them where it goes to the right side and the left side of the body. Well, uh, my time for this morning is up. What I'm going to talk to you when, if you come back and visit with me at 5.30 is this. There are two, if, if, if every one of those things measures low voltage, no matter what your blood tests show, you're hypothyroid until proven otherwise. And if, because thyroid hormone controls total body voltage, and because fluoride and soy inactivate thyroid function, almost everybody in this room is hypothyroid, even though you have normal blood tests. So I'm gonna explain all that to you and tell you how important it is to getting over chronic disease to fix your thyroid, because it controls your total body voltage. Second thing I'm gonna to talk to you about is that if you have only one circuit out, everything's fine except you just got one circuit, say my heart's not working. Almost always that's a dental infection and I'm gonna to explain to you how that works and what you have to do to fix it. Third is I'm going to tell you that almost all allergies and part of your total body voltage is controlled by your stomach acid. And so we're gonna talk about those things uh, this afternoon at 5.30. So uh, I hope you had fun in the last few minutes. I did, we'll talk to you later.